Welcome to the Author Guide Again podcast. I'm Chris. I'm Ross. <laughs> and I'm the guest. Oh, the, hey, the guest. Henceforth referred to as the guest. I am the guest. I am Derek Powell, and I am the guest. And that and that'll work for tonight. So uh, as always, we're socially distanced. Ross is on the East Coast. I'm in the Midwest. Derek is on the West Coast. At his mechanic. <laughs> yes. Yes. Why are I you mean, back at the mechanic? I, I I mean I live here. You guys, I have an all road, so of course I'm always here. Um, his his bread and butter are Audis and Land Rovers. So, you know. So he has a uh, guaranteed life. income for the foreseeable future, at least. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but um, but no, it's uh, it, the the all road itself mechanically is is fine. It's it's sound, uh, but I I just because it's running so well, I decided to give it the gift of a fresh uh, front clip paint job because after, you know, uh, 12 years of um, driving everywhere, it was really chipped and uh, and the clear coat was peeling. And so I thought, well, I'm going to get it repainted. So um, I went to a shop that had been recommended to me and uh, they seemed on the up and up and they uh, called me and said, hey, it's ready. So I went to pick it up. And, um, and the, the the front fender was a different color than the uh, than, than the, 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 the door, which had not been painted. And, oh, my uh, God. So wow. the, the door this is the was first time original, it. and then the front was, I don't know, periwinkle? <laughs> But uh, but as you can tell, they are nowhere near the same color. And the um, oh. the, the the service rep was tried to tell me that it was just a trick of the sunlight. Ah yes, <laughs> the sunlight magically just changes the tint and the color of the paint between you know two pieces of similar metal that are off by you know half inch. Yep, yep. And uh, if you click on that next one, you can see that there was also condensation in the headlight. Um, and then one side of the hood uh, had a seam very tight. And then on the other side was a Tesla Model 3 sized gap. Oh, <laughs> nice. So, Put a phone between We're it. not just talking like, oh, wow, the color's off. We're also talking about just this haphazard reassembly. And so I had actually ridden my bike to the paint shop and I took a look at that. I listened to the excuses. I put my helmet back on and I rode away, um, but not before saying, I'm not going to pick this up until it's perfect. So um, I'm looking at it right now and uh, it looks pretty darn good. It's not perfect, um, but it's now all one color and the hood is aligned. The headlight still has some condensation in it, but I need losses. My yeah. At that point, I mean, a job like that, like as for the, listeners who aren't seeing pictures um the door is blue and the front fender looked purple at least on my computer so it, it you know it's not, just a it, trick. Uh, exactly yeah it's a trick of the light that's such horseshit God. it's not like uh, if anything like the lighting was consent consistent between the two of them like clearly oh sorry anyway but other than that the hour road's great the all road is great. It has two new catalytic converters. Um, and again, my mechanic was like, dude, when the car gets this old with this many miles and it needs catalytic converters, especially in California, people just get rid of the car. Why Usually. did you not get rid of the yeah. car? I said, well, <laughs> what would I get? What oh, would I get? A lower mileage all road. Okay. <laughs> This I am issuing a challenge to to you and to Chris and to the listeners of this podcast. If you can find me a 2004 or 2005 Audi Allroad 4.2, not the 27, 4.2, uh, with five digits on the odometer, uh, please let me know. Noted for my casual, regular Allroad searches. Yes. Yeah. Well, that, 
you're playing into Ross's uh, hand right now because Ross is selling his GX and trying to figure out what to replace yep. it with. So he is very much in the mindset of what are the parameters of my search? So where you have, you have uh, issued a model specific, even year specific. Mileage specific. specific. Yeah. Mile, like yeah. you went with way more detail. Yep. He's like, it's got to tow this much. It's got to have hopefully this much payload and fit this. And so Ross's search Maybe. has been a little more. Maybe. Yeah. We'll say everything will baby. You'll be fine. Is the 4.2. Did you sell your GX or are you kind of like just floating it out there to see what kind of nibbles you get? So it is currently for sale. Okay. It's, it's out there for sale. Um, if it doesn't sell on the forums or Facebook marketplace, it'll go on cars and bids probably sometime later this month. The question is really what replaces it because it was a, long and uh i don't know roller coaster s ride to get to the gx um you know three forerunners uh dan edmonds old jeep wrangler you know there were there were a couple of miatas in there and you know it was just a very roundabout uh landing point so you know start thinking about things and it's like okay so if i get a truck it's got to be able to do truck things but trucks aren't good to drive 99% of the time. So I borrowed a Honda Ridgeline and it's sitting out front right now. Um, thank you, Honda, for giving me a Ridgeline for two weeks, which is apparently not two weeks, not a normal loan. So thank you to them. Um, and I promptly loaded a 1,000 pound quad in the bed and watched the tailgate sag well past where it's happy. Um, so the Ridgeline is out and that's the only pickup that's actually good to drive that I can afford. So now I'm back to, you know, like, all right, what about just a wagon or an SUV or something that doesn't suck to spend every day living with, you know? Um, I, I came across a beautiful RS4, which is something resembling the same engine as the all-road. <laughs> oh my God, putting the quad in that would just put it on its bump stops. <laughs> yeah. So my, my favorite part of it is there is a plan in place, Derek, but Ross doesn't want to share it yet, just in case somebody then beats him to the plan. Wait, there is a uh, there, there's a plan in place. My there, we we think we have card. a plan for moving forward. Yes. Yeah. There's there's a wild card out there. That I mean, I, mean, could I know what I would recommend, but hit me. Um, but I don't know what the so let's 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 set aside price range and you know. All, all sorts of reality. Um, I could see you in like a, a Bentley uh, Defender 90. Um, in a heartbeat. What's that? In a, I would do that in a heartbeat. Have you driven the V8 90? I've, I've driven every, yeah, I've driven every permutation of the Defender. The best. It's just the best. I mean, like, the, the thing is like, so I have I have an issue with every engine um, or I have a I have a an observation on every engine. You know, the four cylinder is great. Um, but it, you know, it sounds like a four cylinder. The inline six has the power. Um, it, it has it has tremendous power, but they still haven't figured out the 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 handoff between the super and the turbocharger. Mm -hmm. So when you are driving it off road, you will get a surge um, as you let off the gas of just a little bit of extra boost, and it puts you farther than you want to be um, on the trail. Volvos um, do that as well on the Volvos? street. Yeah, on the street, I've experienced that. The handoff. Ones? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the the inline six is great for towing, but it also gets like twelve miles per gallon. So yeah, that's. <laughs> v8 gas mileage <laughs> and then the v8 is just stupid like I, I all the right ways i love the v8 but a, a defender with 22s is just that's that's heresy like why do you have why do you have this phenomenal off-road vehicle with 22 inch wheels mm -hmm. uh, the ideal spec for me doesn't come to the states that would be a d90 with the diesel yep um steelies yeah yeah Land Rover, if you're listening, even though I've told you this on multiple, uh, if you bring the D90 3.0 diesel here tomorrow, I will buy it. 
I would also consider putting money down on that. And that even the diesel SUV market is shrinking. I don't know if you guys saw, but Jeep launched a, I forget what they call it. There's a final edition of the Eco Diesel Wrangler they announced this week. <laughs> so edition. it's, yeah, it's got some lineage, some Jeep lineage name, obviously. Um, I didn't. I've completely forgotten that they offered the Wrangler with a diesel. Yeah, 50% of it's them. It's the best and, engine for it. If it works. <laughs> Far out. It's called Far Out. <laughs> Far out. It's the best engine for it because the, the <laughs> Forest is, it sounds weird. The the six is peaky and gutless. The diesel suits the character of that car. So it does. And probably 95% of people have no problems with them, but the 5% that have problems with them, it's like Are vocal. fatal flaws. Yeah, yeah, very, very vocal. So the but, uh, leaving the uh, high school football game parking lot the other night, I was getting into the Suburban with the three boys and parked next to me was a high tide Jeep Wrangler. Mm. And I just chuckled to myself because we are the farthest possible distance away and from high tide. You're <laughs> like, landlocked as landlocked gets there. <laughs> like the river might yeah. move a little bit, but good okay. Lord. It is still better than the Dragon Edition. Whatever yeah. he's like. Oh. It's still the most racist Wrangler I've ever seen. <laughs> it's just so bad. That's saying something. Right? <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> I mean, we don't need to get into other yeah, versions of Wrangler. Um, Jeep owners have they themselves converted to being more racist, but <laughs> answer on that one. Yeah. Um, anyways, <laughs> thank so God. That's kind of Ross's update. Uh -huh. um, have you, I know we talked with Johnny about Escalade V. Did you drive it yet? No, I have it for the weekend of Halloween, but okay. tomorrow, the uh, I have a, a Range Rover. For, yeah, it is the first edition, P530 first edition, and that leaves tomorrow and an X3M competition comes in. When do you I'm get the lightning? Very much coming, looking forward to. Uh, the 22nd or 26th, I don't know, it's a different, okay. Ford manages their own fleet, so they just do things their own way. It's not like lined up with a handoff with, you know, the normal guys I work with. Yeah, yeah, not your normal fleet management company. No. So. All right, that's the one I'm the most curious about, and even just ran. I they just very... bumped the uh, price ten grand or something like that on the lighting on the on the base one. Yeah, if if there was one with a front bench where I could get six in it, I'd probably throw a deposit down. Throw down. I I can't. You can't get one with a bench. They all have center consoles. Hmm. I wonder if that well, has something. That takes you back to, to the Defender. <laughs> yeah, Fair imagine. Guy. I have Chris a is like, much longer commute now. <laughs> Chris is like six foot three teenager yeah. trying to climb into the back of a D90. He's only six one, but yeah. <laughs> oh, only still. Yeah, my my 14 year old <laughs> is taller than Ross already. <laughs> That's not saying much. No, but uh, you're normal size where he's now approaching I awkward size, size with me. So yeah. Um, Yep. He's, he's approaching uh cannot fit in Miata size. Right. Also to set the record straight, $5,000 jump on the base. Oh, okay. Not 10. So still I've been Derek, I've been browsing every plug-in hybrid I can find basically to see if there's a lateral move that could still have as many seats as the suburban. Um, Cause now that I live in adventure van land, like the ability to uh, use a van for something is much easier for long road trips. And so, the daily commuter doesn't need to be the seven seat suburban. Right. But I've already put so many miles on it that the value and what I owe on it no longer are in line. And so uh, raising a monthly payment then to hopefully save on gas, just that I'm going to keep driving the suburban basically. So Matt, I can see you in a Corolla hybrid. I would love it. I mean, the kids, I mean, I, I, the joke last week with Johnny was like, I've been shopping for like $3,500 Priuses. And he's like, you don't want that. And I was like, I know I don't want it, but. Oh, <laughs> man. You want to be a, you know, a New York City taxi driver. Dude, I was just going to say buy a retired city car, like a, a New York City taxi. They are God. Those and the. Um... Sorry, I was, in a, I was in a Camry hybrid oh. last night from Penn Station to Newark. And. I don't know when those shocks went, 
but they have not been around for years. Yep. <laughs> Those roads are also particularly terrible. Yep. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Now, what's the um? They have they have the Prius. Some people run the. Is it a a Ford like a mini Ford Transit? The in Transit the city? Connect. The Transit Connect. Yeah. yeah. And, and the then V two hundred was and V two hundred the official taxi, right? They okay. were, and they were actually reasonably okay, like you know, spacious and easy to get into and everything. But I just always remember, like, there were a couple rides I had in those where I, I the back of the vehicle didn't feel like it was still connected to the rest of the vehicle, going like you know, like <laughs> like you know we're in midtown or something i'm like oh my god we're gonna die <laughs> you know not for the normal reasons you would say that <laughs> wasn't there a chevy version too <laughs> there was a chevy version the uh, city think... express is the chevy version <laughs> real clever with that name oh man googling so fast right now <laughs> you could just google NV200, and it'll still come up probably. It did, but the prices are still ridiculous. Even yeah. for the passenger versions. Just get a, uh, get a, uh, God, what was the, the 2ZZ version of the Matrix? It was the Toyota. Was it a, uh, XRS? XRS. No. And there was the XR, which also could potentially have the 2ZZ but not the S. If you saw S, that was base Toyota. Uh, the XR and the XRS had the ability to have the manual in them. Mm, um, that's what you need. For my commute? Yeah, I can't yeah. tell you how much I want to get into a manual car for my commute. Yeah, get an XRS and then just like, you know, get a second set of tires and rally cross it. Bam, done. D Derek has driven the roads that I would routinely be driving this on and he will know that I do not want that. <laughs> The latest fine public transit transit that they have you know, that that complex web of, of rail and and uh, buses that uh, they've invested in. So Ross, the irony here is there that doesn't exist at all. So that's why he's oh. saying it. Oh, I kind of figured. Tell Ross what the bus stops are called. <laughs> in um, we haven't told him, but I mean, please. Uh, so, so. Kansas has more than than a lot of places. I think I think Florida is the only other place I, I know of where you refer to places as counties just instead of just cities. Like mm -hmm. you know, when you're in Florida, you're like, oh, I'm in Broward or I'm in Dade County. Mm -hmm. So Kansas is the same way, where like on the back of the license plates, you have a little sticker that tells you what county you're in. So like if you're in Wichita, you're in Sedgwick County. So there's an SG on back. Um, and if you're in Kansas City, there's a JO on that for Johnson County. And so the uh, the buses, the bus stops have a sign that says the JO stop. What? It's called the yeah. Joe. <laughs> what? Yeah, the <laughs> JO stop. This is this is so where where Chris lives, you can also go into Price Chopper. And get a quart of milk that says homo milk on it. I'm sorry. As what? in homogenized. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yes, thank you for clarifying this because it did not come from gay cows. Well, I mean, it is the middle of the country. So. <laughs> did not come so from gay Jay cows. Stops, homo milk in uh, uh, Johnson County. So you are welcome, Ross. And I am sorry, Chris. No, you're completely fine. <laughs> now, it, I, you will be. Uh, glad to know that they have renamed it and so um they have now combined so that was that was specifically for like johnson county public transit was the joe but now the entire metro area was like hey we should all work together on this and so now it's all known huh. as as ride kc um oh that's even worse oh, poor, poor KC. <laughs> yeah <laughs> Uh, but he's uh, not wrong. It's still awful, and there is zero rail. Um, the city has one streetcar that drives up and down Maine, and it literally goes from downtown Kansas City to a place that's known as Crown Center, mm -hmm. uh, which is where Union Station is, and it is not 
It's like maybe seven miles total. Um, but, yeah, for the novelty. Yes, yeah. we offer rides. Come to our city. We have tourist attractions. But like with, um, with so Kansas City is one of those cities that got the World Cup in 2026. Oh, we're which, going on an adventure with Derek. Yeah, we are. For the, yeah, for the yeah, audio listeners. listener, you can't tell that Derek's on the move. Um, <laughs> but so because we got, we were picked as one of the bid cities for the World Cup, which we punched way above our weight for that because they only i think they selected like 13 cities overall mm-hmm. and kansas city's like media market like 35 like we are not <laughs> we should not be included in a group of 13 to host the international world cup but the city wanted it and all of the money people in town also wanted it and so um the rumor going around town is like we had the most comprehensive bid and so they were like we definitely have to go to that town because they had their shit together um, which is hilarious because the metro area is two different states, multiple different counties, mm. multiple different cities. Oh, um, and so they all work together and did a good job, but they're looking for investment dollars coming in. So we're actually hoping public transit will get better mm-hmm. because of the World Cup. Uh, and the ability. It definitely can't get worse. The um, weirdly, that I've been divided sucked- by zero. Yeah, I've been sucked down a rabbit hole lately of, of um, like cycling advocates in town. And so like there are places now that you start to see more bike lanes pop up and stuff because they did as cities go, like we are 100 percent a metro area that is dedicated to cars. And it there are sucks. <laughs> and I'm sure, Derek, because you, you're you know more in the industry than we are. But this has been coming up more and more. You know, there are in the states. I mean, how many cities total that aren't like car based? cities or metro areas i mean it's it's a very few right new york I, yeah I, I mean i i the only the only reason i took a taxi yesterday is because it was so late you know there were no mm-hmm. more trains to, to newark but i was yeah just last week i was in i was in montreal um vermont boston and new york and with the exception of of new york because like even Boston is just a hot yeah. time. It's 50 50. And it, yeah. Um, I mean, when you're in rural Vermont, yeah, you need a car. Yeah. Where in Vermont were you? <laughs> uh, I was I was an hour south of uh, of Montreal and an hour north of Burlington. So it was in the stick. Um, okay. I'm going to Google Maps. Place called uh, Enosburg. E N O S B U R G Falls, Vermont. Oh, the people up there are not spelling that right. <laughs> <laughs> I had it as E I N S. I called it. Oh yeah, that's that's good enough there. So I was a couple of weeks back. I was uh, I was in like Pittsburgh, New Hampshire, which is oh yeah right up there with where you were it's uh yeah it's canada so it's, I'm, I'm assuming the trees were great there oh my god they were spectacular <laughs> they were truly spectacular at that time of year exactly because it's barely doing it here so it has Dude. to be that far north it's got to be way more we got leaf beavers yeah. in freaking <laughs> like outside the city i live in connecticut and it's like you're driving and you just see people with their windows down looking and they're not looking for mailboxes or like home addresses they're just looking like loftily up you know and you're i'm just like i just i just want to get home please just move <laughs> you know but it is it's a pretty time of year up there and i hear burlington's great too so yeah speaking of pretty times of year and being outdoors you got to spend some time with a big red truck i did get to spend time with a big red truck <laughs> i got to spend time with the ultimate overlanding vehicle um which is uh, what uh, what Overland Expo calls their build, and um, you know it started life as a, uh, a GMC uh, fifteen hundred Sierra AT four X, and then uh, they piled on about mm, sixty grand worth of equipment and um, created this uh, this this beast of a machine. There's a lot going on in this picture. So it, it, <laughs> for the listeners, it's a, they, I think the AT4X is quad cab only or a crew cab as, you know, speak is now. Um, it's got a, a tray in the back with like a half toolbox 
thing that's roof height going on. Um, I mean, that's Mitt's alloy. That's, is it a Mitt's alloy? Yeah, it's got Mitt's There's alloy no shit, mud really? flaps too. Wow. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, there's a lot of listeners who will will know what it is now. <laughs> um, it's a, it's a lot of build. I, my question is, what's happening with the exhaust? Why does no. it look like there's um, titanium like blue flame tips on it from like you know a a, a Lancer from 06? Yeah, it's a, it's a Magnaflow. <laughs> it's a Magnaflow setup, and a lot of the commenters uh, on this article. Um, snarked about the tailpipes saying, you know, how, how many times did you scrape the tow hitch and the tailpipes? And uh, the answer is zero. I, uh, <laughs> as you know, you have to be careful when you're going off-roading anyway um, and being, um, being cognizant of all the different things. Um, and that includes uh, the extraneous bits, the dangly bits that uh, you might have put on after. The dangly bits, yes. I like that. You're welcome. So um, it's just it, you just you just factor it into your departure angle, and um, mm -hmm. you really just try to position the vehicle so it doesn't uh, it doesn't scrape. Um, hmm. It sounds great. Um, it really uncorks the V8, and uh, I didn't have a chance to tow with it, but um, uh, but uh, I, I'm sure that. Um, sure that'll it'll tow as well as an ap4x uh, although you know with all that weight on there you just have to factor that into the equation. how much weight does that is that package over a stock at4x i would i would say i would say it's approximately two thousand pounds of gear but you have to remember too that you're taking off the tailgate and some other stuff so um, but I would say that it's probably pretty close to the payload of the AT4X, which is 1460 pounds. Yeah, we, we've got man. we've got Firestone springs in the back, air springs that you can okay. um, adjust with the onboard compressor. So oh, if nice. you have a lot more weight, you can pump up the the springs, or you can air them down just like you would tires. Hmm. But throughout, I, I thought the ride was was I thought it was very capable. That's pretty cool. I, I'm happy that they're doing stuff like this, you know, because there really is like a trickle down effect. I mean, we're seeing it with Rivian with like, you know, onboard compressors and things like that, just straight from the factory, you know, yep. and the modularity that's coming up now, you know, the ability to just like unbolt stuff and bolt stuff on like GMC's showcasing here is like, it, it's, it's, I mean, at an extreme price, don't get me wrong, but it's opening up like a whole new world of, you know, off-roading and overlanding that, I mean, we only really saw from Australia until exactly. like 10 years ago, you know, and, and now it's just like <laughs> casual, you know, another, it's a, it's a hell of a build, but you know, it's like, it's not the first of anything ever. So well, it's cool to that's see. The, that's the thing about overlanding, right? It's, it's like 2009 Overland Expo, Held their first uh, held their first event in Prescott, Arizona. There were three hundred participants that showed up, and it was just a niche thing. Mm -hmm. And if you take a look at it now, now they have like what five events covering the entire the entire nation. You've got Overland Expo West, uh, Pacific Northwest, East, and I think Mountain, Mountain. as well. Mountain West, and then isn't there an Iceman version? There could be. Um, I just know that when I went to the inaugural Pacific Northwest event, there were 300 exhibitors. Yeah. <laughs> East, um, East just happened last yeah. weekend and there were 600 vendors. It is That's crazy. It's, it's the SEMA of the off-road world. Yeah. Yeah. Which, you know, I mean, yeah, take that focused. as you will, listeners. Yeah, I've, right? I've been to two of them in the last calendar year and had an absolute blast of both. So, because everybody there is, they know what they're, they know, yeah. they know that they're going to see what they want to see. Yeah. And it's, I, I think it, that's where it differs from SEMA. Although, yes, you have the same people at SEMA who are there to see what they want to see. Um, but the, the nice thing is about overlanding or Overland Expo for the most part is that 
there's a different sort of there's a different sort of buyer. There's a different sort of crowd, um, and within that, you could you can find you can find the people that you might want to go off roading with. A hundred percent. That's my my favorite yeah. part of it is having people walk up and be like, "We are completely full full size pickup slide in camper. This is our train of thought." And then they're like, but now we're looking at this thing over here with an, a no bed, an entire box on the back of it. It's a completely yep. different setup than what we were thinking versus the kids that are like, now I've got a motorcycle and I slap a, a pop-up tent to the back of the motorcycle. And that's right. how I go. Like just these, it it's, it is a very specific show. It, it seems like it's a very niche market, but like there's all of these different versions of it in that. Yeah. You've got the bike from the bike to the earth roamers. Yeah. Right? There's right. such a huge gamut. Dude, I finally got in an Earth Roamer at, at Mountain West. <laughs> and are you laughing because it seems like it's actually worth the uh worth the money on that or it is um I don't know how, how to say if things are worth the money when you we're over half a million dollars. I, I literally I just don't I don't know how to process that. Um yeah, I guess to those buyers, if like you have yeah, that to money the, to spend on one of those things, then it's worth the money. Yeah, because to, that money doesn't make a difference in you know in putting food on the table. And like the amount of solar, the amount of fresh water, the amount of onboard fuel that they have, like all, all of that, it's just not in my use case. Like I, yeah. as much as I in in my mind, like I feel like that's a lot of what overland and like is romanticized, of just like. I'm going to tour the world like uh, Richard and Ashley Desta glory. Like let's get in our pickup truck. Let's go to the tip of South America or mm. wherever they are now. I need to follow back up with them. <laughs> I haven't talked to them in a while. Dan Grek. Just yeah. Like, yeah. I have my vehicle and I'm going to go see things where it's just my schedule is youth sports. And so like seeing an earth roamer with all of that capability and equipment and just stuff, it's, it's way overbuilt for, for what I was doing and for, yeah, and and I think that was the conceit of, and that was my takeaway from from driving this and seeing those things. It's kind of like overlanding. It's I guess it's like any hobby that kind of evolves, right? Uh, you start with the hardcore people, and then it evolves to mainstream, and somewhere along the way, um, that there is this this uh, domestication that happens. Yeah, And for me, the best part of overlanding is that you are escaping all the trappings of civilization. You are, you are, you are, you are able to run away from the, the, the societal structure that, uh, that you live in. But when you have earth roamers, when you have these extremely capable vehicles, when you have all this stuff, you're kind of just taking your living room with you and... The scenery is different, but where where is that sense of adventure? Where is the the sense of you know, roughing it? Um, and and it's just for me, I, I could never drive an Earth Roamer because what's the point? You know, it's Area. a I mean, it's a motorhome on thirty threes, <laughs> bigger than thirty threes. I say they're bigger than 33s. yeah, they're probably thirty eight or motorhome on thirty seven. <laughs> but I, I think but, they're no, like forties. I a thousand percent agree. I mean. You know, my, I think my, aside from, you know, the technical aspect of off-roading, my actual favorite thing about going into the woods, you know, going into remote places is just the disconnect, the, you know, leaving the cell phone behind, not being able to get messages or emails or phone calls or anything, or, or think about, you know, like reality or how fucked up the world is and stuff like that. And you just get a total mental reset and being out in the world like that still connected you know with like a satellite on top of the roof and everything i mean open to try it I'm trying it if, if earth roamer wants to throw us a truck for a couple of weeks i mean we're happy to <laughs> test it but <laughs> i will come to colorado <laughs> yes happily but you know i i think um in the, god this is gonna be the most profound thing i say on the show isn't it um in 2022 you know everybody's so head in their phone, head in their laptop, just nonstop grind, like got to always be on kind of thing that <laughs> the break from reality and the, the like proverbial and literal breath of fresh air is, you know, 
It's, it's the best thing about wheeling, you know? You yeah. get out there with your friends and you don't think about the shit you got to think about 24 hours a day otherwise. And that, that was my other favorite part is that, you know, we were accompanied by, um, you know, in addition to, to the, uh, to the AT4X, we also had an 87 Montero and an 86 Land Rover Defender 110, um, and a, and a 2008 FJ, as well as a, a 15 or 16 Forerunner. Um, but the Montero and the Land Rover, especially, uh, they just, they didn't give a shit. They just went everywhere. And you could just see the joy that they had in going off road. And mm -hmm. I, I don't think that because their cars were less comfortable that they were sacrificing anything on the trip. If anything, they were having more fun because, well, yes, it wasn't my truck. So I wasn't going to, you know, bash the, the, the skid plates, but I also, I also had this sense of self-preservation or preservation for the truck. It's kind of like, here I am driving $150,000 worth of equipment and I don't want to scratch it. And meanwhile, mm -hmm. these guys just, they're, they're just having a blast. And at the end of the day, they get to set up camp and snooze through the night and, and wake up and get to do it all over again. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's, there's a freedom in that. Um, as you're going to go get your, your breath of fresh air, there's this freedom that you get to also, uh, put a few scuffs on your car and it just adds even more character. Mm -hmm. it, look, it looked like you got some decent scuffs for sure. <laughs> That's desert pinstriping. Come on. It, it, it buffed out. It was fine. It, was... it did buff out. Yes. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the Overland Expo rep was, uh, was, was nonplussed, so. Um, dude that's fantastic so if you were to build your own personal off-roader four-wheeler overlander kind of rig i know the answer already <laughs> it's derek <laughs> oh no 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 i, I mean you yeah, mean no, yes we because money's not an option here. So yeah, it's a yes. <laughs> no, and that's the thing. That's what that's that's the takeaway I got from this is like get a a narrow older scrappy Japanese vehicle. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, during top year I got to drive a a, a 91 Jimny and I, I it was just such a hoot. Um so yeah, like why not get a why not get a trooper or uh, a Montero or, or, you know, if, if you get American, get an XJ, um, yep. um, something that has tons of off the shelf parts and indestructible engines and great off-road prowess and just make it yours. Um, yeah, I would take my all road, but uh, <laughs> there's, there's a limit to what you can do with, with something like that because the aftermarket isn't there. Mm. Was the 91 Jimny black? It was like a dark blue and it had like, it, it said intercooled on the side because it had a, a, a turbocharged intercooled 660C three cylinder. Oh boy. A ripper. I think I, I think I found a shot of Jethro in it. <laughs> was this the episode with the Via Cross? Uh, yes, it was. It was the episode okay. with the Via Cross so, the and the H2. I had a Via Cross and I like older ish Japanese vehicles that, you know, you can buy and not care about. Don't buy one of those. That, that is not the right car for that. <laughs> Good God. Parts are not easy to come by. Yes, it was, uh, it was, um, you know, when you go off road, the, the things that you need to learn are, are patience and, uh, and pace. And, um, I think I think the H2 attracts a type of driver that that harbors neither, and so. Uh, you mean elegance is not part of the H2's design brief? No, it's <laughs> it's not. It it really isn't. And uh, uh, that uh, that poor H2 sat there for the rest of the day um, until we had a, a chance to get a, a tow truck in there and take it out. Oh. 
like did you have to have to call a local like off road wrecker or did or did you have we had, lined up? I mean we had we had a full support team um, because when you're when you're going off some place like Yermo you really need you really need off road support so um, it was just more of a question of we were halfway up that trail where you see that Jimny um, that's close to where the the H two kind of bit it. Um, so we, we first had to get it out of the, the treacherous mountainous part. Um, and then we could take it, uh, and put it on, uh, a flatbed and get it back. Recovering vehicles off-road is a skill. The, the word skill doesn't even begin to, it's a you know, crest the, the, it's madness, a proper off-road recovery. Oh no. But I, I find the image of where it went all wrong. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Hold on. I'm going to have to zoom a little bit. It's not quite as high res enough. Ciao. Is it, the uh, <laughs> it's cross-eyed? A little bit. Those Both front wheels are pointed at each other. Didn't go well. Seen better days. Yeah, it, and it was a it was a, a question of like, uh, can we just like, can we finesse it up this hill? And oh I'm, seeing, I'm seeing a royal we just so we can I can take responsibility off. <laughs> so, um, but as you can tell, that that H two was not stock uh, no. to begin with, and so it was it was already fragile, and <clears throat> I don't think those tie run ends were. Uh, in good shape to begin with but yeah um hitting that rock and watching them go in it was exactly how you would expect it the machine would go but look the the jimny was was tossed about jethro was not not easy on that car and it just it took everything that we could throw on throw at it so um i have enormous respect for these these smaller japanese off-road vehicles um because they just they just keep going did you? So I can't remember who, but somebody took a Jimmy across Iceland, and it, Robbie, you know, that was oh, that was Robbie. Yeah, Robbie DeGraff had a he, that's what he rented when he was there, and because oh, yeah. like, he's normal size like you back. are, he slept in the back of it. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, but the Jimmy is like becoming the sleeper enthusiast choice. You it's know, true. it was it's the true. Montero for like two years between you know jeff and lynn and who else bought a montero everyone but everyone owns like... montero like do you know we for a while we were a mitsubishi podcast for like <laughs> seven weeks we in a, a row mitsubishi podcast. Uh, yeah. With, without ross or i owning a mitsubishi because it, it's glucker it was lynn it was the four by four were guys with their delica and their montero oh um, um, it was andy uh andrew collins Warren. Andrew Collins and Andy, Andy Lowenthal from Warren. Warren. Okay. Yep. <laughs> it was yeah, that was and we didn't even fun. get into like Aaron. We've never talked to Aaron Robinson and his Montero. Like it, it was just... yep. yeah. There's there's a lot, and I think that's where you find these darlings. And and I mean, who knew when the GX came to the states in 2004, 2003, 2004, or whenever that it would it would be it would attract such a, a, a passionate off-road crowd. Yep. I mean, Lexus was one of the vendors at Overland West or at, right? at, at the at, at, uh, Pacific or, Northwest. Pacific oh, Northwest. they had that uh, LX600 build there, right? Yeah. 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 Oh, but man. still, it's like to, to have Lexus show up to... to uh, hey, you know, I was one of the first people to talk shit about Lexus, but like the V8 that they're still building is arguably the best sounding engine on sale today it really is it really is i still haven't driven an lc 500 and it's very very high oh it's so good Bill and i sat in one at the auto show and we like got in the car together and we both looked at each other like oh and there's a hybrid version too so i'm trying to sell that one (laughs) no 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 stay far far away from that car stay far away from that car oh derek you're ruining it for me how's that i know I know that's why I'm that's why I'm on this podcast. <laughs> the Crushing the hopes and dreams. The, the guest ruins everything. That would be a great name for a show, actually. Well, there's Adam ruins everything. I was Adam say Adam Conover has turned that into multiple yeah. TV yeah, series. That's true. 
it's like a who's line kind of thing like the guest yeah. is always the one you know <laughs> cracking everybody up um speaking of crack ups uh how's the cayman oh boy okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah well i mean so so i, I think and and this will take us this will segue segue in us into the next part but uh perfect you know, uh, for the first half of the year uh, this year, I was shooting a documentary and I was traveling quite a bit. And so the Cayman, the, the GT4 um, was not driven much. Actually, it wasn't driven at all. It was under its cover in my garage, snoozing away. And uh, I came home at the uh, end of the shoot and um, got in the GT4 because I was going to take it to Thunder Hill for a track weekend. And it would not start. And and it lives on you, a tender. Uh, it was on a battery tender, um, but it, it, it just it, it, it cranked. It just would not start. And um, so I thought, well, that's weird. Um, <laughs> it's got seventeen thousand miles on it, uh, and it had a it had you know it had gas in there, and I thought, well, maybe it's bad gas, but no, that wasn't it. And so I had it flat bedded to my mechanic where my all road was already there. And um, they just wanted to be together again. They just wanted to be together. And um, he sends me some pictures and he's like, he goes, bro. He, he prefaces the text with bro. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. And it's like a relationship with a mechanic, though. Uh, it's a great relationship. <laughs> he's fantastic. Um, and uh, he says, he doesn't say anything else besides bro. And then he sends me pictures of the engine cover, um, which has a bunch of tracks on it, animal tracks. And then he takes his phone and, and does a video across the engine uh, where I am seeing missing wiring and okay. missing connectors. Um, and then later on, uh, missing connectors to the uh, fuel rail. And uh, it turns out that a bunch of rats had uh, camped out in my GT4 and had eaten every uh, edible piece of wiring that they could find. Oh, no. So no wonder it wouldn't start. That'll do so, it. That'll do it. It wouldn't start. It wouldn't steer. It wouldn't do anything. And so... Uh, this was an engine out job, oh. um, and I got a bunch of lovely pictures with the uh, Cayman up in the air and the entire powertrain on the ground. Oh. Um, <laughs> and he went he went over the engine from stem to stern, replaced uh, the, the engine harness and um, a, a lot of attendant connectors and whatnot, and then put it all back, and then uh, he fired it up. And uh, still had no power steering, so he took uh, took apart the front, where he found that the power steering lines had been also chewed through. Oh, jeez! That necessitates uh, a body harness, which means taking the entire car apart. Oh man, I he says, helped do a couple of those when I was working at a Volvo dealership, and it is a it's process. A it's a process. And he, and he says, "Bro." I'm not going to take apart the car. I can fix these wiring harnesses and, and make them look as good as new, especially because it's localized. And so he, he wrapped it up and I got the car back. I'd say about a month ago, it was out of commission for the, for the entire summer. Oh. Um, and I took it for a rip up uh, Angeles Crest with my friends who had a uh, GT3 touring for the weekend. And um, it acquitted itself perfectly. So. The GT4 is back, nice. um, rat free, and there are now uh, electronic rat traps in my garage that will fry a rat when they walk in. And there um, are some some mutated rats running around with power steering fluid in their veins. And I'm hoping so, man. Yeah, <laughs> the Motul rat. In the so uh, <laughs> the GT4 is back, and um, I am signed up for a track weekend at the beginning of December, and I'm very excited. Nice. Nice. Yes. Okay, well, story came full circle. The it car did. lives. So now, did. now I want to talk about the documentary, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's talk about the documentary. Because when you shared it, I was very excited because I like seeing any of my friends do stuff cool. 
Uh, but this was amazing. Well, thank you very much. Because I learned a lot. Yeah, so did I. <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine. <laughs> Because there's gotta so, be there's still gotta be stuff that you learned that was set aside. Dude, we had so many hours of footage. Um so how many for, NDAs did you have to sign? Um <laughs> I'd have to ask my producer. Exactly. She, she she was a rock star. She is a rock star, and she handled everything on very short notice, and she made all of this come together. So back up five seconds, set it up for everybody listening. Name yeah. of the documentary, where to see it, because yep, it's, yep, it's yep. worth everybody putting eyes no, on. No, 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 no. I was I was about to get there. So for those who um, wonder what the hell I'm talking about, um, I directed a documentary for uh, Motor Trend called Coding the Car, C-O-D-I-N-G, Coding the Car. And it focuses on the future or the, the evolution of software-defined vehicles. Um, and what software-defined vehicle means is that instead of just having a nav system or instead of just having engine controls, there's a central computer or there's a bunch of computers that are linked together and they work in harmony. And a software-defined vehicle can be reprogrammed. Um, it can be updated over the air. It's, uh, it's kind of like your cell phone uh, on wheels, but it's much more than that because of the myriad safety and security and privacy and, and all the all the requirements that you need to have in a car uh, are multiplied exponentially when you add software to the equation because it can't be any less safe um it, it can't be any less secure in fact it has to be more secure um but the 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 promise of software defined vehicles is that you can continually update them after they leave the dealership so you can get new features and uh, just just new stuff as um, other technology comes online, whether it's uh, smart cities or smart freeways, and um, and going to the different going to the different uh, manufacturers such as Mercedes and Stellantis and General Motors and Honda. Toyota, uh, going to NVIDIA, going and interviewing the guy who developed the low voltage architecture for the Tesla Model S. Um, it was so enlightening. It was it was just it was mind blowing to see just what has been under development for the past you know, 10, 15 years and how we're on the cusp of just some tremendously exciting stuff. Mm -hmm. And so this documentary came out of it. There's also a companion uh, book that Motor Chen published, also titled Coding the Car. And the uh, the documentary is available on YouTube. Um, you can type in Coding the Car. It's on the Motor Chen YouTube page. And um, you can, uh, if you're going to CES in January, you can also see it uh, presented on the big screen, um, as well as get a peek at the, the, the companion book. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. It I, I think it's going to broaden horizons for a lot of people whose whose scope of what software and and technology and cars um, you know is limited to like autonomous cars you know or yeah can I plug my phone in and get CarPlay um, yeah. it's it's really it's really going to open people's eyes to like you know, what we're up against and on the verge of yeah yeah and I, I think that does open people's minds because. You know, plugging in your phone, uh, obviously Apple wants to take over more of the uh, the software inside the car. Um, but we also, you know, Mother Trend partnered with BlackBerry on this because um, and a lot of people might not know this, but BlackBerry QNX software is, is behind the scenes of a lot of manufacturers um, in, in their in-car systems. And it's it's what makes a lot of these connections possible. And that that as the core software then can talk to um, you know the Amazon cloud or it can interface with uh, with Google stuff. It can it can work with the pr pr proprietary software that the manufacturers make. And QNX is this highly, highly, highly secure version of um, software that that started out in you know ATMs and bank software in the 90s. 
and it, it just evolved. Um, Harman bought QNX for a while, used it in infotainment systems, and then uh, Harman sold it to BlackBerry um, at the end of the 2000s because BlackBerry needed a so uh, needed an operating system to go beyond what they had so they could compete with the iPhone. And part of QNX, of course, was the automotive side, and it was an afterthought. Flash forward to like five years later when BlackBerry phones really didn't catch on and it was clear that the iPhone and Android were going to be the, the top two. And all of a sudden BlackBerry realized, oh, hey, we have this automotive side. Um, and wow, it's, uh, it's, it's doing pretty well. And so it, it was a happy accident that QNX became the backbone of BlackBerry and that QNX automotive uh, became their, 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 their reason to, to be. Um, and, uh, and so that was really enlightening too. I, I, uh, I had no idea how prolific it was. And so um, uh, all of these, all of these, these, these manufacturers and these suppliers um, and software companies have are working together because if you don't work together, you're going to have a lot of siloed systems and machines that don't talk to one another. And I think the next step, you know, everybody talks about, oh, well, cars are autonomous, but yeah, like how, how do you get there? Like, how do you have a Cadillac talk to an Audi? How do you have an Audi talk to a bus? How do you have a bus talk to a stoplight? And that's all, it's all going to need to be standardized and uh, rolled out uh, across, uh, I don't know, our country, uh, city by city, state by state. Um, and there have, there have to be standards that, that are met. And this is gonna require car manufacturers to work with one another without sharing their proprietary secrets. And so this is hugely complex and, and there are tremendous challenges and we are just on the cusp of it. I mean, we're not even talking about autonomous stuff. We're talking about cars being able to talk to one another first. Um, and, and this is huge. This is really huge, you guys. And on top of all of that, the complexity of, of major automakers talking and cooperating with one another on one another is, is massive. And then you take the factor of them and that they're going to have to do this with each other and with the government, you know, and I don't think a lot of people have any idea how complex, you know, the automotive side of things is, let alone automotive plus government. Yeah. And it's, it's going to be, a, it's going to be a shitstorm for a little while. It's the reality. <laughs> and it's government, it's, it's government at every level. It's, it's, you know, you've got the federal regulations and requirements, which say that the software has to do X, Y, and Z. And then you've got the state governments that have to work with one another to make sure that they standardize stuff. Um, and then you've got municipalities. It's like, what if you have a level four, level five autonomous car? What if you have a level five autonomous car? Um, that requires a 5G connection or it requires uh, a smart city and say you want to go out to the country with your car, like what's going to happen when you go beyond the, the reach of cellular data or you go into a town where they're all still driving pickup trucks? Um, or how... even just like, go ahead, sorry. No, I mean, I, how are these going to coexist? And I think Everybody envisions this utopian future um, where cars are going to drive themselves 24-7. And, and it, as long as we have human-driven cars, that utopia is not going to happen. And so um, it's not going to be, you know, you're not going to flip a switch. You're not going to wake up one day and, and have someone or something drive you to wherever. Um, it's going to be a very, 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 very long transition. Um, and, and I don't know what the tipping point is going to be. It's, it makes me think about, uh, cause like sci-fi, sci there's always some element of truth to sci-fi of where we're going to go in the future, but like so many sci-fi films that have things that are autonomous or modernized or a part of a grid or a system, like the hero ends up being the 20th century gas powered mm -hmm. all manual, like 
I, it'll be interesting to see how we adjust. And 1970 even in that. Oldsmobile 442. <laughs> you know exactly what movie you're talking about. Well, of course it's Demolition Man. It's two weeks in a row. Demolition Man. Make... Two <laughs> weeks in a row. Best movie Good in the God. world. Two weeks in a row. Oh, Demolition boy. Man references. I've oh, loved boy. that movie since I was a kid. So. <laughs> you know, Matt Farron did a Demolition Man reference in one of his Instagram posts. And I just, I was like, yes. Oh, I... On recent shows, he's talked about how in his new house he has a demolition man themed restroom. Yes, he does. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like Matt. That I Matt's always had a decent sense of humor, but that is great. <laughs> yep, yep. I am. Uh, I, I I love that this is the second week in a row that you've had a demolition man reference. And uh, <laughs> who who is ever on next? If you are listening, uh, please use the three seashell seashells, and I will <laughs> see you at Taco Bell for dinner. <laughs> Because they won the restaurant wars. Uh, yes. Oh. oh, every restaurant is Taco Bell. Oh my gosh! I don't have the that next guest schedule. Like, no, I'm looking. <laughs> I'm looking on our calendar. Like, oh man, who's I was like, I've, I've got some in my head. <laughs> oh, I, you want to talk about weird stuff? So this is, and we'll wrap up the show right after this. I'm, this is a completely random story. My son, he 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 has his name. His, his my oldest son is named Connor, right? He's been uh, officiating football games. He gets paid for those. He got his paycheck today. And in the back of it was another paycheck. Whoa. For the person with the exact same first and last name, completely different address. And I was like, oh. And then I just put that address into Google Maps because I was like, oh, I'll just, I'll take their paycheck to them. I wonder where they are. Six minutes away. Hmm. Whoa. That so, is small like, world, man. All right. That's well, awesome. We're not done yet. Drive over to the house, ring the doorbell. Guy comes out and I was like, does Connor live here? And he goes, yes. And I go, I'm pretty sure this is his paycheck. Uh, I also have a Connor who got his paycheck. And I think the league just put both of them together, seeing the same name. I, we didn't do anything else with it. We just opened it. Here it is for you. And he was cool. And I was like, uh, and I was like, what, what's your name? And he goes, well, I'm Chris. <laughs> I was like, shut <laughs> up. <laughs> so there's a dad and son six minutes away from me. <laughs> That has the identical. And my favorite part is what's he driving? Like, a white suburban? No, he doesn't. I, I, to be honest, we didn't get we didn't dig deeper. It was too close. Like it was already like walk outside and get in his truck by accident. That'd be yeah, awful. exactly, exactly. But like our last names are spelled the same way. My name's spelled the same way as his. That's our sons' weird. names are spelled the same way. So like, the likelihood of that happening. It's just you're you're supposed Matt, to walk out and go, there can be only one. Exactly. Like I, it's a Highlander. So he episode. drove a Highlander, is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. He had a thirty five hundred dollar Prius. Yeah. Call yes, back. exactly. Exactly. <laughs> oh, too good. Anyway, uh, we'll wrap up the show on that weird ass story because that <laughs> it was really weird. It was an interesting night. So Derek, uh, what would you like to plug? I mean, the documentary. Please go view the documentary. Yes, uh, please. You know, I, I have to say that I got a, a Facebook message the other day from a childhood friend who now works at a semiconductor company. And he reached out because he said, we saw we saw the documentary. We loved it. We would like to, you know, use some excerpts from it for our own use. But like I hadn't talked to this guy since like seventh grade, eighth grade. <laughs> oh, wow. And he reached out and he also like he, he told me. He, the, the, there was something we did, uh, some science experiment with gummy bears, I think, and uh, he referenced it. And I hadn't thought about that since, you know, eighth grade. And it's hysterical. But the, the people who have reached out, it's like I, I've talked to people I haven't talked to in years who saw the documentary and, and thought, you know, thought enough to reach out, which I think is amazing. So um, if you would like to see it, uh, please see Coding the Car. Uh, on the Motor Trend YouTube channel, and um, anything else to plug? I don't know. Um, I just drove the uh, the 911 GT3 RS that is on Jalopnik, along with a great technical slideshow. Um, I drove the Audi RS5 uh, Sportback with the competition package, and uh, that is at Car and Driver. So, uh, and then uh, next week I'll be driving the uh, Ram Rebel. 2500 um oh, oh. Uh, i i don't have any insight on that yet but uh feel free to watch the documentary read some articles uh you can check out the at4x overland journal ultimate overlanding vehicle on the drive um so there is your reading and watching list for <laughs> and we didn't even talk about land rovers 
we did not even talk about Land Rovers. You competed. <laughs> oh, that is, yes. We okay. might have we might have to do We're a gonna... combo episode on that because yeah. it was you, Jeff, and Brian on a team. And Brian. Uh, oh, I was not on their team. Oh, that you were not on their just team. Jeff, Brian, and Tommy, Micah. Um, but uh, if if you if you want to have a a shift talkers esque kind of podcast, I will be on that because I will shit talk those guys. Let's do it. Let's yeah. have a throwdown. Yeah, um, we will have a throwdown. We will have a throwdown, and we will talk about how I kicked Glucker's ass uh, <laughs> running the off road course. I am uh, hell yeah. Let's sending do it. Jeff a message oh, as we man. speak. Yeah, be like, dude, I hear you got your ass kicked on the off road course. <laughs> this is gonna be good this will be fun stay tuned for uh for internet <laughs> wars <laughs> yeah oh man also jeff if you're listening which you probably aren't please return my message <laughs> yeah return ross's message please it was actually about the land Rover thing and the the place at which you guys started which i know an off-road spot about four minutes from I'll, I'll sneak you some pictures from the event, Ross. Okay, please do. Well, sweet. Um, awesome. You can rate and review the show, iTunes, wherever you listen to it. It's not iTunes. What is it? Apple Podcasts. I oh, hate not guess. having an iPhone. Um, yes, please get an iPhone, Chris. Continue. Go ahead. For as, sake. <laughs> as soon as my daughter ages out, I will. Okay, good. <laughs> Ross, get ready to have your phone be bricked by a toddler. Yeah. That's it. There's a reason I have an Android with kids mode that I can like lock it in and she can't do anything. So um, anyway, like and subscribe on YouTube. Uh, Derek is at Derek Lane Powell or Derek Powell, depending on which social media channel you're on. Figure it out for yourself. Hey, Derek Lane Powell on Instagram and yeah. Derek Powell at Twitter. Twitter. Yep. And he's fun follow either way. Uh, you can follow the Hooniverse on Twitter, the real Hooniverse on Instagram. Uh, Ross is no, not like the one from friends. I'm at overlanding dad. You can read what Ross writes on Hooniverse, UTV driver, ATV writer, and everyday driver. And yes. I haven't written anything in like four months. So yeah, don't read my writing. <laughs> <laughs> so don't because you can't, <laughs> I mean, you can read old stuff, like, yeah. but not nothing, nothing new. So oh from, man <laughs> private sector and spend a lot of time doing stuff for one company now, uh, so. um that's it that's our show okay. thank you derek yeah thanks derek happy halloween almost <laughs> uh i had a great time you guys uh I, I went to unmute my uh my computer and i must shut it down but uh no thanks so much for having me uh it was a blast as always and I am looking forward to the uh, the future throwdown. Oh my happen. gosh! Hell yeah! The gauntlet. I sent him a <laughs> message. We'll see if we can make it happen. Oh man! All right. If Derek, anything, thank we, you. We might not record it. We might just hang out and talk as friends. <laughs> yeah. And not Drink. like the one from Friends. No, not like the one from Friends. Mm, I still got to change that. No, you yep. don't. We have so many episodes where we say it. <laughs> well, I yeah, uh, whatever. I'll You're wait. locked into that forever. Yeah, I know. And I, it now. I am also locked out of Facebook because I fucked up the two factor authentication process. And now I can't get in there. I'm just I like, oh, no, I'll just you're check better it. On. You're better off. I would say I'll check it in I'm not year. seeing the downside. No, yeah. I'll, I'll check it, you know, sometime in 23 or four. <laughs>